93 EO. I'm EO131. And I'm Intelikaya. So uh, we are here talking about advancing Thelema. So originally my idea was advanced Thelema, and then I made a typo, and I thought it was a pretty good typo, right? So advancing Thelema, the idea of um, kind of progressing our current, our 93 current. Um, but I think the idea of advanced Thelema stands where, you know, a lot of people are interested in, in more complex topics, more advanced topics, not rehashing the same kind of um, intro material. So um, we thought we would talk about this subject. How do we interpret Thelema this time? Um, and if it goes well, um, if everything doesn't fall apart completely, well, then we might do it again. We'll see. We'll see. Um, so today, like I said, we're talking about how do we interpret Thelema. I have five or six topics for us to talk about. Um, and that's about all the structure I have planned. So um, just brief introductions. Um, I'm EO131. Um, you may know me from many different places, I guess. Um, I wrote Fresh Fever from the Skies, a few other books. Um, I was in OTO for about 10 years, um, done lots of stuff, and now my main thing is running the website Tholemic Union. Yeah, so um, I, I write and make videos under the name Intelikaya. Uh, I've been interested in spirituality, philosophy, uh, pretty much my whole life, uh, magic for the last 10 years. Um, I uh, update the blog uh, Light and Extension, which is at lapis-makurii.org, and uh, I run also the Mouth of the Beast uh, website, which is a collection of um, introductory Crowley texts, and um, yeah, I'm also a member of OTO, Ordained Clergy, and a Chartered Initiator, and um, just really interested in, in considering new ways of uh, you know, framing Thelema, framing what we do, and picking out different things that are, you know, changing, changing this, this what's what we find salient in all of this. I guess so. I'm looking forward to the uh, discussion today on how to how to interpret in different ways, unique ways. Cool. So um, uh, this will be up on YouTube, and we'll put all sorts of links in the description if you want to follow me. Um, you want to follow Intelikaya? Am I saying that right? Um, I love how you have this really difficult to say Greek name, and then your website is a really difficult to spell Latin word. Um, it's really cool how you put people through the ringer just just to follow you. Yeah, yeah, yeah you have um, to work for it. Exactly. Yeah, it's not easy. All right. So, like we're saying today is how do we interpret Thelema? Um, first topic we got is. Are we allowed to discuss Thelema? <laughs> Are we allowed to discuss Thelema? Are we allowed to discuss the Book of the Law to begin with? So the context of this question obviously comes from the comment to the Book of the Law, the thing that comes at the end of the Book of the Law, says, you know, don't don't study this book, shun people who discuss it. Each person interprets it for themselves with reference to Crowley's writings is basically what it says. Uh, I'm going to assume that people are somewhat familiar with Thelema in this discussion, although I'll also try to explain things just very briefly if they come up, or uh, maybe I'll stop you if, if there's some kind of technical thing um, so we can explain it. But again, this is kind of more advanced stuff, so we're not going to spend too much time trying to explain the basics. So are we allowed to discuss Thelema and the Book of the Law to begin with? I'm going to throw it over to you to start. People are allowed to do whatever they feel like doing. I mean, that seems to be one of the <laughs> misunderstandings of, about a lot of this. As soon as you start to offer some kind of interpretive framework or some kind of explanation, it's really common to get this response of, you know, well, I guess by your definition, I'm not a Thelemite. Like, like as if the very activity of interpreting would cause someone to be excluded or would uh, cause someone harm. Mm -hmm. I mean, my feeling on it is that if you're not at the point where you can answer that question for yourself, then Thelema might not actually be for you. Right. Yeah. So 
you know, there's a lot of people out there who have this view that any, literally, anyone who discusses the Book of the Law somehow doesn't understand Thelema, doesn't understand the comment, um, and they're committing a boo-boo, I don't know, a, a, some, a bad thing, a, a sin of sorts. Um, and, you know, my experience with this topic is essentially, you know, being part of OTO for 10 years, okay? You, you, you go to a lot of classes, right? A lot of different lectures, a lot of different discussions, even just informal discussions over some apothic red probably is what's going to happen. And people very freely offer interpretations, but not explicitly, right? So it's, it's often through context where someone will say, oh, you know, every man and every woman is a star. So, you know, you're the center of your own universe and you get to blah, 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 right? So in my view, that is just a straight up interpretation to, to use that line, to keep talking, to explain it. Um, and then those very same people will turn around and say, no one can interpret it for you. You should never really discuss it publicly, that kind of thing. Um, and so one aspect to this is kind of a, a weird hypocrisy. I don't know if it's overtly hypocritical or if it's just kind of not realizing that you're doing doing a contradiction where um, as long as you don't do a line by line commentary, you can kind of slip by. But people who do very explicit commentaries, like if you say this is a commentary to the book of the law and line one means this and line two means that then that is kind of the ultimate sin. So so part of this seems like kind of uh, not realizing that everyone's interpreting it. If you talk about Thelema at all, it basically necessitates some level of interpretation of the lines from the Book of the Law in particular. Would you agree with that? Yeah, and I, I would say that um, the work that I've done recently in particular with the consensus thelema article is to show that there actually is a pretty definite relatively speaking a definite interpretation of the book of the law and of thelema that is out there it's just not referred to as such and i think that's actually far more pernicious than anything because right it allows people to say on the one hand um things like either that they're Everybody's interpretation is individual. It's a purely private matter. We don't discuss it. And yet, in terms of how like interactions with people are structured or how people structure their relationship with the spirituality, there actually is a lot of uniformity to it. There is actually an interpretation lurking, lurking back there, which is strongly normative. Right. I mean, to go back to your point, I think that, you know, even even to say that, you know, as some people do, that the entire message of the book of the law reduces to just one line, do with that will, is itself an interpretation of, of the book of the law. I mean, granted, it's based on, you know, on, on what Crowley himself said, which is technically what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to be informed by his by his commentary. But that's, I mean, of all the lines in, in the book, there are a lot of really, you know, ones that would give one pause to, you know, reflect and wonder you know, what's involved in this to simply reduce it as we always do to, you know, let's say two lines or three lines, if you want to throw in the bit about the star, um, is itself already a fairly restrictive interpretation, in my opinion. I so think, I, th I think, I think it's already right. going on, like you said. Yeah, the, that the, the same thing happens with the comment where people say, oh, well, it obviously means this, you should shun people and you shouldn't discuss it publicly. Well, that's you're supposed the, to burn it. Right. You're supposed, you're supposed to burn the book. You, it's supposed to say burn in it. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Burn when it says destroy. Um, but, you know, the comment itself requires interpretation. It's words. They're ambiguous in some ways. And the fact that there is an accepted interpretation um, kind of flies under the radar because it, you you have this cover of everyone interprets things for themselves but we actually all interpret it the same way and i i mentioned this a a bit but the most obvious one is that the very same people who will say oh you can't interpret the lima for anyone else if you say will is want or imply that in some way they will freak freak the fuck out right and like of course will is not want 
And it's like, well, that's ac- actually, that's a, it's an interpretation. Nowhere in the book of the law does it ever say anything like that. Um, so it requires some level of interpretation. It's just, in, in my experience, it's the most common interpretation that people will kind of insist as dogma. And I happen to agree with it, but still, it's, it's an interpretation on some level. And, um, you know, I think, I think we agree that we are allowed to discuss Thelema. We are allowed to discuss the book of the law. Um, and even if you take the comment seriously, the worst, the worst consequence of your sin of discussing it is that some people will shun you. Um, and that doesn't seem like the, the worst punishment in the world. Depending right? on the people, it might be okay. Right, yeah. It might actually be good for your mental health to be shunned by some of these people. Okay. So it's actually a net positive <laughs> in a way. Um, but the the idea of um, somehow not discussing the book of the law is actually preventing dogma from arising seems to be a very strong belief among people. Yeah. And yeah. I think the problem there is exactly what we've been talking about is that there are dogmas, but they're actually more as you say pernicious they're more nefarious they're harder to see because they don't jump out at you and say this is an interpretation that's right it's just a consensus that's kind of in the background that people don't question um and one of my one of my personally my big points is what is the net effect of not having no one discuss the book of the law publicly Versus, say, having a ton of people discuss the book of the law publicly. Um, And my personal view is that a culture is kind of enlivened or invigorated by having people discuss it, especially if they don't agree, right? Because there's all these different ideas that are coming together and there's this kind of combat of ideas, the marketplace of ideas, whatever you want to call it, um, and the best one shall win, right? Um, So it's kind of... People can can take from these different discussions what they will, you know. So so we're saying that discussing it increases, uh, or I'm saying that discussion of, of the book of the law increases kind of a livelihood of our culture. It increases this ability to discuss things, and people who say that we're protecting dogma are actually ironically the the gatekeepers of of the dogma how is how is that possible right what do you think yeah i mean i i guess to come at it from a slightly different angle i would question like right now i mean the only thing that there is a quote-unquote restriction on is direct interpretation of of the book of the law which actually makes up a relatively small part of Crowley's overall corpus or even part of his writings that have anything to do with Thelema you don't see a ton of discourse around these other texts either so true I mean I would question like if we could just suddenly like like if we created some kind of space like I would argue that the space already exists for people to talk about the book of the law if if they want nobody's gonna like Nobody's going to stop you or like come to your door you know, and yeah, re- revoke your Thalema card or like write you a ticket. So it's like <laughs> the absence of discourse around this, I don't think actually has a whole hell of a lot to do with the comment per se or even with the nature of the book of the law. Like there's a there's a lack of discourse in general. And mm-hmm. the reaction that you're talking about with like in terms of like if somebody interprets the book of the law, like. You find the same thing if you try to interpret the Gnostic Mass. I find like it's sure, actually not that true. it's actually not that different. There's there's and this is what I mean about you know just to, to the point that you were just saying that there actually is a dogma there. Um, as soon as you start to offer an interpretation on anything, which starts to make other things more salient than what people are used to being salient, uh, they there there's this weird attitude of like somehow by simply offering an opinion on it and when i say offering an opinion i mean not just offering like a statement on what something means but i mean like you know offering evidence for it or conversely if somebody gives their opinion on it to say like 
well, hey, like, why do you, why do you believe that? Or what's, what would be the justification for, for believing that? There's this attitude of like, if we start to expect people to give and receive reasons for things, that that somehow is going to lead to the establishment of a dogma, which to me is very hard to get my mind around. Maybe this is because I have training as a philosopher, but to me, expecting and giving reasons for things is the opposite of authority. That's what it seems like, yeah. <laughs> that's that's normal, right? Because you can't question authority. Like authority just tells you, like, you do it because you do it. Right, <laughs> I say I'm so. I'm in charge. <laughs> so I see, I see that the, there's three possibilities there. There is one, there is, you know, an explicit authoritative dogma. Two, we expect and give reasons for things. Or three, everybody is just kind of isolated in their own little sphere mm-hmm. without this being a social phenomenon. And so I think it leads to this kind of balkanization of people of like, well, I don't know. I'll kind of leave it there. I see, I, th- I see those as the, as the three options. What do you, right. what do you think of that? Well, you know, con- well, c- kind of connected to this is this idea that simply by offering your opinion, people jump to this conclusion that you are setting yourself up as the authoritative voice on interpreting Thelema because you've offered an opinion, even if you offer all these caveats, this is just my opinion, which obviously it is, Who, whose else's opinion would it be if you're the one talking? Um, but, you know, no matter how many caveats you give, there's going to be people who say, oh, so you're the Tholemic Pope and you're going to send me to the Tholemic Gulag because now you are interpreting it for me and my Tholema is not okay. And this, this view that someone offering their opinion on something, their interpretation of it even, even if it's a direct interpretation, somehow imposes on you to accept it or, or die, or I, I don't know. Um, that seems like a fundamentally mistaken view of how the exchange of ideas even works. And right. and I believe you've said at some point, um, you know, if you were to like look up a YouTube on physics or something, no one would be under the false impression that it's the only interpretation out there that exists and that everyone else is a false prophet, right? It's just only in this one tiny little area of Thelema and interpreting Thelema is offering your opinion. Um, it means that you're the only person that can possibly be correct about it. But I don't think pretty much anyone speaks in that or thinks in that way when they're offering interpretations. Maybe some do, of course, but... Um, I mean, they're obvious. <clears throat> there can develop cultures where you have like a person who's just really skilled, or maybe they just kind of like browbeat all the people around them. But um, that's a very special sort of sort of situation. I, I mean, mean, I try to browbeat people, but you know, even then, it's not successful, right? No, it's not. It's not. <laughs> it's not sustainable. I mean, I had a com- I mean, I recently I had an interaction with someone on line. I said I said something to the effect of. Um, talking about the importance of, of justification or ju- you're just justifying your reasons for things or just thinking in terms of like, you know, do I have good, do I have good reason to believe X, Y, or Z? And somebody actually replied to me and said, well, who gets to decide what's justified? And I was like, I'm thinking to myself, like, like, is that how debates work? Like <laughs> that at the end of it, there's like a third party that is like, that there's the decider, right? You have two people with this who disagree. And then there's a third person always there who's the decider, right? Mm-hmm. And if and they decide at the end, this person won, and the other person is like, I don't know, put in a like a a, a safe and pushed into the bottom of the ocean. Banished forever, like, yeah. Yeah, that's how it works. You've lost. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like usually what happens is that my my experience is that a few things can happen when people debates one person might be completely convinced by the other's position and change their mind that's that's quite rare i was gonna say yeah. um yeah another one might be that it just kind of, you know comes out to a draw that's a possibility that's you know and they go away unchanged both of them that's that's possible or maybe that one or the other considers the argument later on and changes some portion of their mind or maybe one person kind of sympathetically speaks to the other person's position and says like hey for the things you're looking for, it might be better if you moved closer to my position rather than the position that you're at, because it would better serve your own ends. I mean, there's so many different ways that yeah. 
the process of giving and accepting reasons could go. I don't, I can't, aside from like a court of law where somebody's like on trial for murder or, you know, armed robbery, I, I, you know, that's, that's a very, you know, then in that case, somebody's put in jail, but that's, you know, that's a very specific, <laughs> that's a very specific case. Right. So I don't, I, it's hard for me to wrap my mind around that kind of reflexive kind of knee jerk, you know, who, who gets, who gets, who gets to decide that? Who gets right. to decide what a good, you know, justification is. And it's like, and the other thing it does is that it, it kind of cuts off the lemma from the ordinary world where we kind of already do know what good reasons are for right. things. Like we have, it cuts us off from common sense, which I think is, is, is mm -hmm. another problem here. That's right. I, I think, I think that's exactly right. Yeah. The, I'm sure there's going to be people who say, well, how come Yahweh 131 and Intellikai, now they're under, they are the ones who are authorities on interpreting the Thelema, and now this That's is correct. the authoritative way of, of understanding it? No. That is, that is correct. Right? That it's it's correct. inevitable to come up in the comments or whatever. But we're just offering two different opinions. We may not even agree on certain things. It, that's okay. We're not supposed to come to a final authoritative conclusion where the other one goes to jail forever. Uh, that's not really the aim. It's to share different opinions and people can consider both sides. They can think both of us are wrong. I don't care. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's a sharing of ideas. And my view is that sharing ideas, discussion, conflict, debate, these things advance the conversation, whereas refusing to discuss it or pretending like you're refusing to discuss it when you actually do, you know, that actually kind of stifles the development of the current in general. And um, I personally think that it's it's partly the cause of some of this, what, what feels like Philema is never really doing anything except rehashing the same thing over and over and over again. Um, so much of, of content of books is just the same thing over and over again. You know, Curly was born and then he did ritual magic and now he's dead and you should do ritual magic too. Right. Um, we need something new, some new ideas, some new perspectives. And, and it's bizarre to me that some people find that so threatening and then use some kind of religious authority to stop that conversation. Um, that, that is what it is. That's actually a really good point that they use. It is a religiously sanctioned uh, stifling of reflection and, mm -hmm. and of critique that's so i mean to be worried that a dogma is going to be a religious dogma is going to be established like that's the situation we're in right now as far as i'm concerned right um right. i think we should just move on to the next topic yeah go ahead which go is uh topic two what are common but ineffective approaches to interpreting thelema so aside from this fact that a lot of people interpret Thelema without even realizing they're offering interpretations. Um, there are certain ways of interpreting Thelema that people do commonly. Um, so I thought if, if there are certain ways that you've noticed that are trends among people of ways that they tend to interpret Thelema, but are probably not the most effective, what do, what do you think about that? Um, yeah, there, there are, I think a couple broad categories that they tend to, to fall into. One of them I refer to as the reductionist approach to it, where it's pretty much just boiled down to do what thou wilt should be the whole of the law. And like, that's, that's it. And, you know, you just sort of stare at this one sentence as kind of like a Rorschach lot and i guess you just you know take from it whatever you will but i think <laughs> the way that that ends up most commonly getting used is as for, for i i was i was calling it a a secular framing for occult practices or maybe a secular framing for belonging to a church i'm starting to think now that maybe that's a little too general i think it might be more like an anti-authoritarian framing for magic okay which, interesting i mean e either either way you put it I, i'm not entirely sure like most magicians or you know witches that i know uh, are thelemite or not are already fairly like secular right. <laughs> in orientation and already relatively anti-authority like you have to i think already be a little bit anti-authoritarian or outside the mainstream to be doing you know magic it's, already. it's so. somewhat of a given yeah that's right so what, what what's like an example of how that would look 
Um, I think the secular the, the secular framing of it would be that um, well, I mean to 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 go back to what we were talking about a moment ago, um, the interpretation that people have of, of the comment is a, a pretty good example of this. I think what it does is it turns each person basically into their own church. It's you and your sort of private um, interaction with the book of the law. It's actually very, very similar to Protestantism. I think if right. more people, I think if more Thelemites knew about like Lutheranism or, you know, that they would understand that that approach to Thelema is very, very similar to that, that the Protestants, it was a private relationship that you had with, with the Bible, not even, not even with God. So right. it's, it's actually very similar. Uh, not in, mediated in through a priest or an organization. Or, right. a, a, or, a, or so much as a single thought, apparently. I don't right. know. <laughs> a single bit of history or intellectual history <laughs> or, 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 or whatever. Um, yeah. And I mean, the other thing is that you know, I, I think I think that the attitude toward not interpreting Thelema for other people is kind of informed by that idea, because as soon as somebody's, I think the idea is that as soon as somebody starts to offer an argument or an interpretation or defend something, it kind of makes, um, it stops being, somehow, some way, it starts to encroach upon other people's freedoms to practice as, as they will. Like there's not really any distinction drawn between being an authority on Thelema versus having a certain degree of expertise about certain areas of it. So like, as so like even competence becomes kind of like a a, a threat to is competence is confused with authority, and mm -hmm. so it has to sort of be attacked. Um, I, I would say like the general sort of left leaning tendencies of, you know, a lot of Thelemites center left orientation tends to kind of kind of mesh with this. Um, there there are numerous. Um, exam I'm like the way that you know OTO is sort of organized is almost as like a secular state um, with no with there being no interpretation of Thelema at the center of it really or at least none that's stated explicitly like that I would ascribe to a secular approach to to Thelema so I mean you see it in a lot of ways like generally it's the sort of either you know to each to each their own we're all sort of isolated and in our own personal relationship with the book of law all the way up through like the sort of more knee-jerk you know kind of like reactive like fuck you approach to any attempt to like try to offer anything that kind of stands out <laughs> a right. little bit so that's that's the that's sort of the reductionist approach that i would say you know i, I think it. some people they hear this idea of oh you're you're your own church and that actually sounds quite enticing that sounds quite nice um, because organized religion is centralized historically it's very oppressive and so we're each our own church so so what exactly is lost in that approach um i think what's lost i mean to to speak to to speak to some of crowley's own concerns about it um he talks about how the how one of the main points of life in general is to discover things about yourself and discover things about the universe around you and to measure your relationships with the other stars around you mm -hmm. basically just kind of you know soak it all in but not in a kind of like passive just sort of like sitting back and appreciating it way but actually like going out and engaging and putting right. ideas to the test and having that conflict um because conflict brings out truth i mean he says something to that effect and i think that's i think that's often very very much the case you learn a lot that's about right. yourself um we test ideas that way we become if you can put your ego aside you can actually arrive at a bit of self-reflection like mm. you and i have had like disagreements before and i've gone away and i've you know thought about it and been like you know and revised something in my head right it's like that's that's kind of like a normal mature reaction i think to discussing or disagreeing about things even if they are of, of a religious nature right. and so i guess what i would point to as is, is say that um just because we're dealing with a religious phenomenon that's not an excuse to just throw away common sense or throw away good good judgment and and yeah we do have to respect each person's freedom to think what they will and speak what they will but that does not include treating every opinion as though it's equal or claiming that every everybody has a right to their opinion that's right. actually a different claim because to have a right to an opinion means that it's justified <laughs> and that's a, that's a very different thing theoretically from saying, right yeah, yeah. You, have, you have the right to speak on, on something so 
I, I, I am sympathetic to it. And, but I think that the, I think that each person's space of their own religious experience can very easily be respected at the same time as we recognize that interpretations are secular matters and that they are things that we can, mm -hmm. you know, disagree on and that have to obey certain, you know, norms of basic rationality and common sense. Right. Yeah. I mean, this, this kind of reflects this idea of a certain way of interpreting Thelema is that everyone has their own interpretation and should essentially be isolated from each other, right? No, no connection, no interaction, because that would somehow pollute um, our own purity, our own personal interpretation, right? We're, we're all our own church and no one knows what the heck anyone else believes because who cares? Except everybody's reading the same, except everybody reads the same two or three secondary books on it though. <laughs> right. So... How's that supposed to work? Then like, exactly. okay, let's be really isolated. You know, so this is an impossible experiment, but like if you sat everybody separately and had them read the book of the law, my guess is that they would come away with very different views. Right. That's not the case. Like they're reading the same, it's probably not even three books. It's probably like, honestly, one or two books on their secondary literature. Yep. You know, the ones that I'm talking about. Surely. And they all come away with the same, and those are fine books, but if there's only two of them and everybody's only reading two of them, then- it's right. not it's not the case where everybody's their own church everybody's their own church where they're reading the book of the law plus this other one single interpretation of that's it. right yeah yeah i mean that there are some dominant books right there's there's lon lon Duquette books for example and i think we both respect lon Duquette, but the fact that everyone reads these same books and then pretends like they all have these completely unique perspectives when in reality they're all essentially carbon copies of each other that's certainly a problem, and it's exacerbated by this idea that no one can tell you what Thelema is, which in, in practical terms means no one can actually challenge your view. You don't even have to consider any kind of challenges to your view um, because you're, you have your own truth, um, which sounds good and it sounds right, but in practice, you've essentially set up a hall of mirrors where everything is just reflecting your own view back to yourself. There's no challenge to that. And, and the inevitable result is, is some level of, of narcissism, of, of, of solipsism even, where you don't even consider these other viewpoints. Like you were saying, you have to consider yourself in relation to other people. Crowley says this in a few different places. Um, yet uh, people seem in practice to, to view even even considering other viewpoints as somehow an offense to themselves, um, if if there's a different viewpoint than theirs, they don't have to consider it, or it's it's somehow easily deflected without consideration. And the end result is people with a lot of unexamined assumptions about reality, about philema, about themselves, because they've never exposed themselves to that that conflict of someone challenging them and saying, well, why do you believe that? What is your justification? As you say, what are your reasons? And maybe your reasons aren't actually that great or have you considered these other things? Um, in my view, and, and on, honestly, I think Crowley's view too in this case is that it's only really through that kind of conflict, through the butting of heads, through the, the challenge of ideas that a, that a, a new synthesis emerges. So if you resist that, that conflict or that union even of two opposite ideas, you'll never get that, that synthesis, which obviously is, you know, an ongoing process. But what we have is people with their, essentially their preconceived ideas are already there. And then they come to Thelema and then they find a reflection of that and say, oh yes, it's everything I already believed. And, and I'm divine for thinking this. And you're God for believing. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and no one can challenge me. Yeah. So um, I just want to keep moving here and we'll talk about does Crowley have a more important view to consider than others in interpreting Thelema? Um, I originally framed this as does Crowley have a privileged view, which is a term that we, we use to say is it, is it kind of a more important view to consider, right? So most people consider Crowley as the founder, if not the prophet of Thelema. Um, and yet some people also say Alistair Crowley, the man, his opinions are discardable, right? Sure. Um, and I think the implication is my views or some, some other random person, Londa Ketter, whoever, 
they're on the same footing as Crowley. Would you agree with that? Um, I think that with regard to whether Crowley is in a privileged position, I, I think I think that privilege is probably roughly the right word for it. Because I mean, all right, let's consider let's consider authority because I think that's where people's minds go anyway. Right. So really to to my mind when i hear that question I, I translate it into like philosopher speak and i think like okay is there such is there a, is is authority does it does the meaning of a text reduce to authorial intent mm -hmm. right this is one of those like problems in in postmodernism that we're right about. death of the author and, and all that yeah and i don't even think that i don't even think this question is particularly new personally i don't know that that even people throughout history have ever thought that the meaning of a text just simply reduces to the author's attempt but especially now we know that there are all sorts of unconscious biases that could show up in a text you have you know prevailing opinions on women you know people who are not white people who are of different classes all sorts of things that would have been in Crowley's unconscious and maybe they weren't necessarily part of his explicit conscious intention sitting down to write something but they could show up there and so of course like are you going to say that you can't do that critique or that you can't point to things in texts so I wouldn't frame it necessarily as as the authority because you can you can undermine that to, to a certain extent too but I, I think I think privilege is roughly right and I would say that yes of course you have to you have to privilege it in some sense but I would say that to privilege something is not to absolutely set it up in, in a kind of like on an incontrovertible pedestal. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, thankfully Crowley actually gave us like a, like a lettering system to know like which texts we're supposed to like pay the most attention to, like which texts have the most authority <laughs> and which ones we are, you know, more or less free to, you know, to, to disagree with. And so you're I talking think about that, like class A, class B? I'm talking yeah. about that. And, and that categorization, I think, is, you know, could be considered problematic as well. But sure. I think I think that 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 categorization shows that even in Crowley's mind, there was different um, authorial authority, let's say, so to speak, that when mm -hmm. he's receiving things as an adept, right? there's a different kind of authority there versus like, you know, Perturabo or Aleister Crowley, you know, writing something down, which is a matter of, you know, argumentation and, sure, and yeah. con conjecture. So I would say that, you know, he, the common sense, common sense would say like he founded Philema, like he basically, I mean, of course there are like many, many antecedents to it, but yeah, I mean, he has a privileged position, but that doesn't mean that you can't challenge and, and question it. I think you could have yeah. So, so it's important to consider, but he's not some kind of absolute authority. Uh, it's possible to disagree with him is, is what I'm getting there. Well, especially since he's bringing in a lot of frameworks, like his philosophical framework that he's using to kind of craft the lemma is something that I think he's getting from the tradition of Western philosophy. Right. Uh, he's certainly getting it from Mathers. And that's a framework that he had in place even before he received the Book of the Law. So there's a right. process of interpretation going on where he's taking the Book of the Law and constantly accommodating it to this to this philosophical framework, which is like roughly like Kabbalistic kind of emanationist view of, 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 of deity. So yeah. I think I think I think it's warranted to criticize that and to question some of that um, that interpretive framework. Yeah. I think that's that's an important point though, that a lot a lot of people don't realize this, that um, the Book of the Law was received in 1904, and he had written actually quite a bit before 1904, and there, there's certain essays in particular, and even certain poems, that really prefigure the Book of the Law, um, philosophically and just textually, right? So there's the there's this, I forget what it's called, the Invocation of Isis, that's from Orpheus or something, where there's a repeating line, to me, to me. Um, and of course that, that occurs in the book of the law as well. Um, and personally, I think, you know, you look at the book of the law and you look at these weird fake <laughs> wrong names of Egyptian gods, right? So Rahwer Kuwait is not a correct name of, of this God. It's, it's like an EA budge ism essentially. Right. Why would I was the, the speaker of the book of the law use something that only Crowley would really get the language that Crowley understands uh, why would he use to me to me why would he use this Kabbalistic zero that appears in Bereshit from 1902 or 1903 or something like that um, 
why is that? And I, I think that at the very least, even if, if the, you see the book of the law as God dictating a book to Crowley, like Gabriel dictating, you know, the Quran to Muhammad, even if you believe that, clearly it was done in a language that Crowley specifically would understand. Uh, and it was specifically addressed to him. So if there's these weird names that only he would really get because it's from the context of his personal understanding, like Rockwork Kuwait or Hadid or something like that, I, I, I think it, it has some level of weight that his understanding of what these concepts mean is actually more important than, say, even a, an accurate historical anthropological view of, of Egyptology, for example, Sure. And that his understanding of these concepts is actually primary, whereas all these other ideas like Egyptology are, are secondary at best um, and aren't actually that relevant in certain cases because he wasn't aware of them and Iwas wasn't really referencing them, in my opinion. Um, and so these these phrases that Crowley is familiar with, like, you know, references to the Book of Revelation, etc., Clearly, he, he understood these in a very idiosyncratic way. Curly was a super idiosyncratic dude. Um, sure. And my view is that his understanding is probably the first stop you want to go to. But again, um, you know, just because he said it doesn't mean it, it is absolute dogma um, for a whole host of reasons. Uh, one being that it seems like half of the stuff he said was tongue in cheek, just kind of jabbing at people. So who, who knows what we're supposed to take exactly seriously. Um, but also Crowley could be wrong, I think about certain things. Um, so I guess, I guess my view is, yeah, Crowley does have a more important view than any random person. Um, but it's kind of a starting point where just to understand to begin with, why, why are these names so weird or whatever? Um, also, just to get away from the book of the law for a second, there, there's other holy books, right? There's Liber LXV, oh. there's Liber 7. And when I read the commentaries to Liber LXV, for example, I would never come to the interpretation that he gives of some of these lines. They're so obscure. Yeah. And, and yet he's so confident in, in that, yeah, this definitely means this, you know? Um, like he, there's this one line where it's like the hawk alights on something. He's like, well, this is the divine consciousness descending and blah, 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 blah. Um, there's a boat and it's like, oh, well, clearly this is the boat of, of thoughts. And it's like, okay, right. I would never come to this conclusion if I had never considered Crowley's commentary or his opinion on it. So, um, I think discarding his view is a major loss. Right. There's there are people who are saying like Crowley isn't even worth considering he's misogynistic or whatever. So we need to discard everything and and start anew. I think that is throwing the baby out with the bathwater personally. Yeah, I mean, I, I see that as being uh, the, the tendency that uh, Heidegger talked about for the will to power to finally become the will to will. Essentially, it's not willing any other content than itself. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, Crowley sets up this system where it is roughly based on Nietzsche's will to power. It's a kind of, you know, creative impulse that's like founding values in a kind of vacuum of nihilism, right? And eventually, it just sort of like decays into this really mediocre thing where people are just like, nah. <laughs> and that's like basically the content of like what they're saying you know we're like i don't feel like doing it you know it's just like it's it's there's no real content will to it i mean you can see that especially when people whenever people talk about like going beyond crowley and it's something that's mm -hmm. like really um there's really not much content it's like it can be very hard to discern what the content is and yeah. or it's just like a rehash of some kind of like paganism or paganish kind of like it's just a basic repetition of what's kind of already there so it's not creative of value in the way that Crowley anticipated it just becomes kind of it becomes re repetition essentially right and I think a lot of people this this whole beyond Crowley movement I do support it in some ways but in practice it feels like it's it's a way to give license to people to just ignore what he had to say and I think Crowley actually had some pretty controversial some pretty challenging 
opinions on certain things. For me, right. for me, they they challenged a lot of my preconceptions as I was reading him, and I value that a lot because you know I want I want to have those ideas challenged, and if my ideas can't stand up to one dead dude challenging them, I don't think they're worth having really. Um, so if, if we're post Crowley, I think we need to be post Crowley in a way that incorporates his view and goes beyond it, not simply ignores it or, or deflects away from it. Oh, he was just a, you know, like Heidegger. Oh, he was a fascist. So we don't have to listen to anything he had to say. Well, actually he had a lot of pretty interesting stuff to say. Um, and it's worth considering, um, and back back to kind of a point you were making before, um, another topic we have is, is there a hierarchy of importance to different Thalamic texts, right? So you're talking about the class system, and I think that's kind of the classic, the classic way of talking about hierarchy of importance. And so are there a hierarchy of importance to different Thalamic texts? Are holy books um, more important to consider than, say, his class B or class E texts? like uh, Lieber II, Ma Message of the Master Therion. Um, and I think especially important are considering Crowley's commentaries to the Book of the Law, which a lot of people dismiss because he said, oh, you know, the, the commentaries are a bunch of turgid nonsense. Um, however, the, the ideas from his commentaries seem very influential, right? There's a bunch of weird cocaine rants, of course, that are crap, Right, where he's like going on for three pages about the nature of a cube in hyperspace or something. Um, but are Crowley's commentaries worth considering, basically? What do, what do you think about the hierarchy of importance of these texts in, in, in an interpreting Thelema? So, I mean, dismissing the commentary because Crowley said to dismiss the commentary is just is just Crowleyanity right there. I mean, people like people will talk about like, you know, <laughs> oh, you're just a Crowleyite. Like what else is what's a, a better indication that you're a Crowleyite than doing something just because. Right. The, the question isn't whether Crowley said something. The question is whether given his premises, Crowley was justified saying something. Again, there's that horrible word uh, justification. Um, right. Well, that's hard would, because you have to, instead of just accepting or denying something, you have to think about it. That, that takes, that takes extra it. energy, right? So I, I, I would say that it depends, it depends how, you're, how you're coming at it. So I would say that um, if your interests are purely magical, mystical, then I think that the, um, the class A texts are, are, are very important. Um, right. I would say that that's more like, I mean, I mean, it's interesting because Crowley had this order AA where like the book of the law was incorporated into it and Thelema was incorporated into it in ways, but it also predates Thelema it does, yeah. sort of, or his acceptance of, of the law. Right. And so it's, that's not really its focus. And so I would say that from a purely magical mystical approach that the class A texts could have that priority and you could just simply ignore Thelema, right? Like if you just had the class A texts and like without any kind of guidance at all, they were just these mystical texts that you were just going to like, you know, just go straight at. I don't think you would draw the conclusions of what we consider Thelema. Right. There's a religion thing. named Thelema and it has these tenets, right? Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, you would, you would draw some very, very, very different views <laughs> on things. I don't know. It's kind of an interesting thought experiment. Um, I think so. Yeah. I would say that, um, if you if you are a Thelemite and you subscribe to these particular views of, of Thelema, I think the other texts become much more important because I don't think people realize the extent to which their own patterns of thought were already kind of determined in advance by a particular philosophy that Crowley had. And that contemporary Thelema is kind of an outcome of that. So right. I think that the contemporary framing of Thelema tends to be like a kind of, you know, do it if it works for you kind of pragmatism sort of thing. It's this kind of pragmatic um, framing. And so that seems like the opposite of philosophy, but yet it's not because actually that comes out of a particular reading of Crowley's like more intellectual work and the commentaries on it. Mm -hmm. and I don't know if people realize that. And so by going back to those texts and considering the intellectual basis of Thelema, you can engage in an act of reflection upon your own presuppositions and update some of those frames and begin to wonder like, okay, so these things that I consider to be salient, like, 
are there other things that might be salient and might they enter into contradiction with the things that I currently, like you got, it could actually start to become a very interesting, you know, possibly catastrophic unraveling of your own frame and, and an opportunity for, um, for, for a moment of awe, let's say, or a moment of, of perplexity at, at, at the very least. And mm -hmm. that's, that, that's frightening for some people, but I can say that for myself, it's always very valuable ultimately to, to pass through that. So um, in that, in that sense, in terms of sort of like introspecting on your own assumptions and this sort of weird, you know, framing that we call Thalema, I think it is, I think it is valuable. Mm -hmm. I think it is valuable to do that. Right. Yeah. I mean, um, there's definitely this interesting kind of dialectic. I, I kind of referenced it before of, of Crowley, the Magus versus Crowley, the man. And people make this distinction a lot. I don't know how valid that distinction is in the end of the analysis because it, because it, it was the same person at the end of the day, right? Um, and I personally believe in kind of a more embodied philosophy. You know, we're, we're limited by our physical incarnation and all that kind of thing. That being said, you know, I like you were saying, if you were to basically give people these class A texts and say, go at it, and not give them anything else, um, I think that many people would not come up with the kind of Thelema that we have today. Um, I believe it was you that said, if, if you if you gave a bunch of people the book of the law, they would not point out, do what thou wilt should be the whole of the law is the most important line, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's, that's a very important point, is that that itself, the framing of do what thou wilt should be the whole of the law is the most important point of Thelema is itself an interpretation, um, and one that is not necessarily borne out by the holy books itself, right? It's not like there's this internally consistent argument purely from the lines of the holy books that would s support this. Um, do what thou wilt should be the whole law actually comes at the end of like this weirdly long paragraph about like these three grades and blah, 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 and then do what thou wilt should be the whole law, right? Um, I think, you know, it's, it's interesting to consider that um, and, you know, maybe this goes into our, our next topic, which is could Crowley have been wrong about his interpretations? It's possible that Crowley was, in fact, say, receiving texts from God or even divinely inspired with the holy books and that his rational mind, his various personal motivations um, would interfere with interpreting the holy books in a way right um uh, i believe it's marco passi who wrote this article or a book basically saying that crowley's view shifted due to his political concerns of kind of um you know having himself as the primary authority within thelema and, mm. and, and viewing thelema as a religion Whereas earlier forms, like in the equinox area, were more skeptical, more scientific illuminism, and that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, I've heard people say that. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a it's a very in interesting idea that the holy books are holy, and Crowley did not necessarily understand them completely. I think I think that's actually built into the Book of the Law in particular, where it's it says lines like, you know. I see you hate the pen that, that writes these words, right? Um, Crowley was actually, theoretically, you know, consciously against some of these tenets that were being described. And if with our modern understanding of human psychology, naturally, Crowley, the man, if we're going to make that distinction, would be twisting these ideas to conform to his own preconceptions um, in, his, in his interpretations. And that uh, it is possible he was... He was wrong about certain interpretations. Um, one of the kind of classic ones I, I think about is that he interprets chapter two of the book of the law in a very social Darwinist way. And, mm. and that really kind of rubs a lot of people the wrong way naturally after, you know, surviving World War II and the Holocaust and that kind of thing, eugenics. Uh, we don't look at social Darwinism in such a positive way. Um, what, do, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting if you if you look um, 
if you look closely at the commentary, it says um, each is to interpret the book for himself. I think by by appeal through my writing or right. something to that effect. But the um, the comment is not signed Alistair Crowley. The comment is signed Ankaf Nakansu, who, as far as I know, did not author any other uh, text. So the Stella, um, maybe, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, the, I I think the current interpretation of, of I was actually speaking to somebody about this the other day because I recently wrote an article raising the possibility of reading the Book of the Law as against Crowley's uh, own interpretation, and. Um, I said, yeah, that would probably violate the comment. And somebody chimed in and said, like, oh yes, definitely. Most <laughs> like that's a very common view on it. And I I understand that that reading on it. Um, however, if if you view, if you take the comment literally, which is of course always a problem with any of these texts, but if you do view it literally, it was written by Ankaf Nakansu, who wrote no commentary on the book of the law aside from the, the comments right so. so it's like reference my writings but i have no writings so screw yeah, so, you. So, yeah so fuck you yeah. <laughs> exactly you're on your own <laughs> so yeah i think it's i think that's uh I, I think it is legitimate because i've i've made this argument before crowley was taking the content of the holy books and he was kind of you know taming it in a way by wrapping it around these sort of western philosophical frameworks of of holistic monism and kind of you know, turning it into a religion of imminence and and turning it into this thing of, you know, very similar to uh, Nietzsche's idea of, of the will to power. And mm. it's very interesting if you go and read the holy books, it's actually quite different. There's much more of a sense in there of someone being knocked back on their heels right. by, by something that is cur like almost forcing an opening on them. I mean, you could interpret that that phrase a number of different ways depending on the depending on the text you know because there's like <laughs> kind of homoerotic uh, aspects in relationship to god or, or the universe sure, yeah. and th there's not the sense there of you know i'm my own boss and you know from this seat within the center of me i am creating and determining value it's like no man god is just coming in and just like slapping, That's slapping point, the hell yeah. out of you. and it's very different uh it's got a very different tone to it so also if you read uh the vision and the voice too there's much much more of an emphasis on uh what i've called uh the erotic unbinding of the of the ego well it's something i got from the non pedenburg white but she emphasizes that yeah more of a sense of um, the will being incapacitated um, mm. and not being being knocked off center, not the center of, of, of value. So I think that is a very fertile area to, to, to work in, to read these, you know, some of these texts against Crowley's kind of domestic domestication of them, as, mm -hmm. as I'm calling it. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, there's a line somewhere where Crowley says, says like, Iwas is not arguing with you. He's telling you, <laughs> right, right. right. So it's this idea of, you know, this is not a conversation. I'm telling you how it is, you know, right. and we have this philosophy of like, I create my own world. I create my own value. I create my own meaning. I create my own gods. I create my own practice. I decide everything for myself. But when you go to the holy books, it's very much actually the opposite of re right. receiving this revelation, receiving this divine influence, and being subjected to that that truth that is maybe not so welcome, maybe not so obvious, maybe not so already accepted. Um, you know, it, it really, there's this... This unfortunate thing in modern spirituality, I don't know how modern it is really, but it feels like an extension of kind of our, our late stage capitalistic society where we all decide for ourselves and we make our own choices. And, you know, as, as, as you've often made the point, you know, that's not good enough. Making our own choices is also divine, right? So just, just making our own choices makes us a god. Um, but throughout all of religion in particular, it's really this theme of of exactly like Iowa says, I'm telling you, you know, I'm not arguing with you. This is a divine revelation and you have to deal with it basically, right? So um, again, I, I feel like um, this this kind of modern, as, as you say, consensus theme of I decide everything for myself is is really a way to set up um your own preconceived ideas as holy 
um, when the entire idea of, of religion, of philosophy, of, of all these different fields is to be exposed to something maybe that has truth in itself or a force in itself that you have to grapple with, right? Reality kind of hits you in the face and you can't just say, well, no, that's not reality, right? You have to, to deal with it and what, what the message is in itself. No, that, that's, that's, that's really good because I think that that's an opening onto like a different way to approach this. Because I, I also want to emphasize that I don't think that simply going in the opposite direction is the answer either, that we just go back to like, you know, a hole breaks through the ceiling and like, you know, the archangel comes through and just tells you to do something. And it's like, all right, I'll go lead a crusade now or something like that. Like, it's, <laughs> I don't, we, want, we don't want to go back to that either. I think what we want instead is... Um, how, how to put this you, you want you you need something to come in from the outside to intrude to kind of to break in you have to at least have enough openness to allow that to happen to kind of complicate your picture of things to experience that moment of awe that moment of opening so that you're forced to transcend the framing that you have and to come and to and to look at it to look at it to be forced to look at it essentially from the outside in other words to be decentered so that you're not right. the center of, of the universe and then but then you re you reconsolidate right so you know your brain is presented with all this new information and it breaks all these you know neural connections and you're just like oh my god what's going on right we've all had this experience you know in one way or another and then when the panic sort of subsides right you form you form new connections and you form a new wiser a relationship to the to, to life, meaning that you hopefully have a deeper connection to yourself, a deeper connection to the world, a deeper connection to other people. And it doesn't stop there. It continues to go and it doesn't have any kind of finality to it because really what your your brain is doing is kind of, you know, fitting itself and evolving as it goes to, you know, the texture of reality and divine reality or or or, or whatever it is. But like you can never get there if you have this kind of like vapid kind of framing for things where it's like i get to just you know everything is just choice right, right. that's not that's a non-starter for this like you need to be able to have enough openness to be knocked back on on your heels to kind of get that 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 process going because right. if you don't to not be able to do that i would say is is arguably what stupidity is like if you can't manage that so right well it's it's like you have this kind of vulnerability or this openness to consider other perspectives at the very least right um and th that's kind of this formula that we talk about solve et coagula right it's right. by exposing yourself to these new ideas it throws everything into that chaos of solve and then it can synthesize into a new coagula but that's just you know one step of the process and it keeps going Whereas, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, a lot of people have not even gotten to that step because they come at Thalema in this way where I get to choose what I like and I get to discard what I don't like, um, which has some va validity to some extent. But if you take that as the main way of determining value in a, in a system, then there is no way that you will have something beyond just a reflection of what you started with, right? There's no way to, there's no opening, as you say. Um, you've essentially constructed an edifice, a wall, um, and imbued it with divine authority now that it cannot be, you know, penetrated in any way. Um, and I, I think this is, it's kind of a, to, to really belabor this metaphor, it's really this kind of, um, this really rigid, crusty kind of philema that people have where it's, it's essentially, I already know everything. I already know all this stuff. Um, and I'm going to choose what I like or, instead of frankly learning, right? Growing. I, th I, th I think that's a really good point, especially the emphasis on, on learning. I mean, here's, here's, here's a different way of, of framing it and tell me, tell me what you think about this. Cause I think a lot of the problem starts that, that people think that the will is something that's like inside of them, that it has a kind of essence and all of the knowledge is in there already. And it's just a matter of kind of like coming to terms with your authentic self or blah, blah, blah. To me, that's a lot of words, but what if we look at it more from like an evolutionary 
point of view, where like the mind is really kind of constantly in flux and constantly trying to fit itself to something, to something else. And there's always this kind of evolutionary give and take, like you're not arriving, like, yeah, there are these moments of self-transcendence. There are moments of you becoming less foolish and becoming wiser and, you know, being hopefully a slightly less of a, a dipshit, right, than you were yet yesterday. So, but that's like an evolutionary process. Evolution doesn't go toward a particular end. It doesn't go toward like a super self, right? And it's not something right. that's already latent within the organism. Rather, the organism has to grow and adapt itself to these new experiences and to these new new openings. That's like, right. I think that might be a better framing for spirit for spirituality in general as opposed to this kind of like authentic self or you know true will you already have it inside of you kind of thing i don't know what do you mm -hmm. think of that i i if if we keep going with this series i think true will is absolutely a subject we should focus on um and how it has essentially been manipulated to this cause of deflecting any kind of criticism any kind of challenge from the outside and instead set up people as kind of their own narcissistic king of the world um with it in a very kind of immature undeveloped way of just protecting yourself from from being exposed to to differences of opinion, to, to, you know? to different, right. to different opinion. It's like right. It's it's like yeah. this bizarre thing where in normal life, if you were to go around and and act this way, you would seem like a crazy person. But it's it's accepted as a, a way of life in Philema to completely discard anything anyone ever says about anything. Um, that that's like borderline psychotic in the rest of the world. Um, but it's holy. In, in, which I think, which I think goes to show that, that Thelema is by following that path, it's not connecting you. It's not causing a deeper connection with the world around you because it's mm. only true. It's only true when you're not connected to the world around you. So there, so it's not, it's not meaningful. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's really kind of a, a theme that's, that's worth picking up. It is your philosophy creating a greater engagement with the world, with reality, uh, with tackling the, the difficulties of reality, or is your philosophy essentially a way of avoiding and deflecting from all these things? Yeah, I, I feel like that's really kind of at the base good, yeah. of yeah. of a lot of these these trends. Yeah. Um, of course, the people who use this to deflect are never going to admit that. Um, but it, it seems like it, it's worth saying. And I think people can start to detect that in their own, their own selves and other people that are saying that. So, um, obviously we've been going on for a while. So I just want to go to this last topic and see if we have any, anything to say about it. Um, there's a lot of talk momentarily, um, in our space about, um, going beyond Crowley, this is actually kind of an old idea. I, I remember sure. when I first started with Thelema, there were conferences called literally, I think literally called Beyond Crowley or, or Going Beyond Crowley. Um, so it's not this new idea. Obviously, you know, there are people like Akkad, Fratur Akkad, who wanted to do the Eon of Ma'at. Like, sure, yeah. like a day after Eon of Horror started. Yeah, and like literally, literally next day. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's like, okay, well, that was a good day. And now we're into the new Eon. Um, but sure. it, I think it is an important idea. Crowley, as f I, I think we can all agree on one thing. Crowley is dead. And um, Thelema lives on, maybe in some weird kind of monstrous hybrid formation, but it still lives on. How can we go beyond Crowley and... <laughs> And more importantly, how can we do that intelligently, right? How can we do that in a way that's actually beneficial to ourselves and kind of beneficial to the health of Philema as a current, as a philosophy? Yeah, that's that's such a great question because what I find is that when people go beyond Crowley, like you have to wonder, like, is it is it beyond Crowley or is it just different from Crowley? Because mm -hmm. it's very it's very easy to create something different for, you know, different from one thing you just you just change it around but no what nobody ever really addresses is like well what's the yardstick that we're going to use to say that we've actually gone beyond rather than backwards or just or just laterally so yeah i think that what we need in order to go beyond crowley and i i am an advocate of going beyond crowley i'm very critical of of, of crowley and thalema um 
But what we need is a framework to think about what it is that actually makes a spirituality successful. And in particular, I would say that we have to address some of the basic sort of like meaning crises that, that we're in. So like the, you know, the, the pervasive sense of disconnection from each other, which is exacerbated by, by social media and the fact that everybody's doing a solitary practice now. Um, the sense of being uh, disconnected from, from ourselves, from our own core of meaningfulness and our own sense of, of satisfaction and, you know, all the, you know, outrageous lengths that we go to in order to feel ourselves and, and to feel alive. I mean, Crowley was no stranger to that. Look at all the, you know, crazy stuff that, that you know, all the extremes that he went to as, as an individual. And um, also, we need to think about connecting deeply with the world because we don't want to have something which is just simply at odds with our best models of, of how the world works. Because then, again, you're, you're cordoned off. You have something that only works when you're alone with the door closed and the, you know, the phone off. You don't have a, you don't have a path through life. So I, I have a lot more to say on this, but I think that for starters, I would think about those three issues, more deeply connected to yourself in terms of like transcending your transcending your own ignorance growing in wisdom right swapping out those sort of delusional frameworks for ones that are that are more successful and better fitted to, to reality so again and again more co connected more deeply connected to the world around us whether that's you know nature or however you want to look at it and more deeply connected to other people like are we going to be able to feel deeply connected in our relationships if we take ourselves to be the centers of our own universe and thinking that all problems that have to be solved are solved at the individual level. I don't think that that's realistic in our day and age. So I think that would be a general sort of map of the, of, of the way forward. Yeah, you know, one thing I hear in there is essentially Thelema needs to address the crisis of nihilism, right? Yep. There needs to be a, a real accounting of does this somehow address the issue of the lack of purpose and meaning in our world, in our life. Um, and it cannot be, so this is something we didn't really touch on this time, but it, this problem cannot be solved with cliches, right? <laughs> it cannot be solved with a pithy, oh, well, I create my own meaning. It's That's like, right. well, that, that actually does not solve the problem at all. It kicks it down the field like one yard and yeah. we're, we're still, you know, fourth down and 50, right? So there's, a, there's a, a problem here and it can, it's a very real problem. And I think in our world, in America, for example, this has led to the rise of, uh, paramilitary organizations of fa I was say fu fun fundamentalism. Yeah, yeah exactly. Fundamentalism of all kinds, yeah. fascism, uh, Christian theocracy. That's right. This is on the rise. This is not dying out. This is on the rise. Um, and we are going to have to grapple with a world where uh, there is not a God to simply dictate our meaning, right? We cannot take it as a given anymore. Right. And, unfortunately that has led to the rise of authoritarianism the rise of these of, of new forms of tribalism including on the internet with social media right the rise of personality cults um the and i believe that for thelema to be a real philosophy in the sense that it, it has a real influence on people's lives it has to address these issues in some fundamental way that is not a cutesy quote that is not something that simply says, oh, fuck you, you know, or that simply says, I create my own meaning, ha ha. Um, right, right. Um, something that is like a one line throwaway where it f it feels funny or it feels cute in the moment. Clever. It clever, feels clever. clever exactly. Right. Clever yeah. Responses. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So you, you say it and then you fold your fingers and you put them on your <laughs> belly. You, you, you lie back and you say, ha ha, I've solved nihilism with my, I showed him. Exactly. I showed him. Yeah, exactly. Um, so if we do beyond go beyond Crowley and I hope we do, I don't think it's in the way of ignoring Crowley. I think that's obvious that we can't just ignore it. Sure. Um, I think it's not in the way of bringing in our own idiosyncratic interests. 
like, oh, I'm into shamanic drumming. And so Thelema is actually about shamanic drumming sure. or Enochian or whatever other like weird occult interest you're into. It has, I, I think I really agree with this idea that it has to address these fundamental issues of existence of our, our, our meaning of our connection to one another and, and interpreting the world in a way that it's worth, it's worth living. Right. We're not just, absolutely. Uh, hopefully we're not just Sisyphus pushing this rock up indefinitely and just imagining ourselves happy. Right. There may, maybe there is a way of viewing the world that is actually fulfilling. <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine that. Yeah. So, um, so I don't know how we should end this. Maybe I should maybe I should say something like you should like and subscribe and uh, visit the links in the description if you want to learn more about Thelemic Union or Intelokaya's work. Um, I know you have your own YouTube channel where you put out on it, yeah. content there, a blog with different interesting articles on there, and um, you know I hope we continue this this conversation in in a, a future segment of advancing Thelema. Yeah, looking forward to it. All right. So uh, 93, everyone. Um, I think you now hopefully accept us as the true Thelemic Popes and um, we'll catch you next time. 93.